Welcome back to our four-part series on everything you need to know about bore scoring. We're back at Ellen Engineering with Charles and with Lake. And now that you've watched the first two episodes, you know what bore scoring is. The next question for us would be how to identify, and if you have it, what, what do you do about it, right? Yeah. Be sure to log into your YouTube account, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a video. Let's say you don't know. Let's say you don't know. What are the things that you can do to just try to prevent it? So like we talked in our last video, you want to have a PPI done before you buy a car, and if you already own it, we call it a post-purchase inspection, yeah. uh, which isn't always the, the best thing to do, but you gotta, you gotta it's know. It's reality. It's reality. Yeah. Yeah. So you go in, you don't know, the first thing you would do, bore scope the engine. And like we discussed, you don't want to bore scope from the spark plug, you need to bore scope through the sump, and you want to look at the bottom of the cylinder, because that's where it always starts, is the bottom. If you see at the top, it's already done. Mm. So you want to go through the bottom. It's always bank two that starts first. And usually it's cylinder number six. That's the worst, but it can happen in, on any of the cylinders on uh, bank number two. Um, another good way to check for bore scoring if you have no symptoms would be used oil analysis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just by taking a very simple sample of the oil, we can see what the levels of silicon, aluminum, iron, we talked about the previous videos and that piston is aluminum, but it's got that iron clad skirt coating on it. And as that co coating comes off, you can see that in the oil and you can know it's coming on. They can also, because of the aluminum and silicon in the block, you can see those levels coming up. We, we see it with speed diagnostics every single week or so. You're gonna see somebody come in. We just, this past week we saw one where they didn't have any symptoms of bore scoring, but it showed up in the oil analysis. We let them know, hey, listen, you, you need to start investigating this. So, I'd say, yeah, start with this. So that's probably the least expensive, easiest to do, mm -hmm. for, and for someone that doesn't have maybe a shop that they've chosen yet, something you can do pretty quickly. Right, yeah, this is something you can do in your garage at home, yeah. right? Pretty simple. Then if you do see, hey, high levels of aluminum, silicon, we got some iron, possible bore scoring, then it's worth maybe spending the money to go ahead and get the bore scoping done, see how bad it is, where you're at, and then make the decision from there, what do you want to do about it going forward? Now, we've been focusing on the M96, M97 motors in the series to, so far, mm -hmm. but this applies to other engines as well. Correct. Um, it can, if you have a Macan, Panamera, Cayenne, they all have the same technology for the engine blocks. They're Aliasil, where this is a Locasil block, but still the high silicon content aluminum, where there's no coating or plating on the bore, and it's raw aluminum. Mm -hmm. So the same wear metals you'd be looking at it's the same thing. Same thing. The using oil analysis and then bore scoping would be how you would diagnose those cars to make sure if you have a problem or you don't have a problem. Okay. So again, oil analysis, but then as far as driving your vehicle, maintaining your vehicle, what are the things that we can do as an owner to mitigate the problem? Well, fuel is the enemy of your oil. That's the number one biggest culprit. And we see that I'd say, nine times out of 10, when we have an oil analysis report and there's high wear metals, there's also high fuel dilution first. Because what happened is fuel always lower the viscosity of the oil. And viscosity is the most critical, you know, characteristic of a lubricant. So it helps create that oil film that we talked about in the earlier videos. So when you have high fuel dilution, you're gonna have lower viscosity, that's gonna trigger increased wear. So the best thing you can do is make sure you have clean injectors. So you know, AAA actually commissioned a study a few years ago and had an independent lab do all this testing between premium, we'll call it standard fuel. Not top tier. Not top tier. Okay. And premium top tier fuel. In fact, you know, the EPA has a thing called LAC, lowest additive concentration. So all gasolines in the U.S. have detergent additives in there to keep injectors and intake valves and things clean but there's a, a minimum level. Well, most companies, because you know, additives are expensive, go to that lowest level. Mm -hmm. So it can be premium fuel. It can be 91, 92, 93 uh, octane fuel, but have that low additive level. Well, there was 19 times more deposits on the LAC premium fuel compared to top tier premium fuel. So you're comparing premium to premium, not even premium to like low grade fuel. Right, this no. Because low grade will be even worse. Will be even worse. Right. But so, with 
So premium low additive, LAC, yeah. LAC and premium good good premium. Top tier. You saw 19% more wear. 19 times, not 19%. Oh, 19, 19 times. times. Orders of magnitude. So for those of you that are watching that have always said, should I pay for the good stuff? Yes. yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Really? Yes. It was, I, I was even shocked, right? And I've been involved in this times. stuff for a long time. 19 times more deposits with the LAC premium fuel compared to the top tier fuel. Now, I think you had a photo, and we'll put it in the video, mm -hmm. that shows the valve yes. of how much more deposits around it, and it's, it's incredibly visible. What was really cool is that they went back and took the engine that had all the deposit built up on it and ran it on the top tier fuel, and it cleaned it up almost completely. So after the fact, mm -hmm. so there's another good one is, actually I had this, this discussion with my daughter. She's like, do I really need to put premium in my car? Not only do you need to put premium, but you need to be put good premium. They're top tier. And it actually might reset let, you know, the car that she just got. I'm sure they took care of it too. But for other people that don't know mm -hmm. the care of the car previously, by starting to use top tier premium, it might reset and clean up some of the stuff that has built up oh, to exactly. that point. Yeah, because what happens is, the, for the injectors, which is the key thing for, about bore scoring, is that the deposits form when the engine shuts off because it heat soaks. And then it, the fuel carbons up. Right. And then that will clog the injectors, change the spray pattern. Now you're not getting good atomization. Well, now if it doesn't atomize, it can't vaporize. So you get liquid fuel getting into the uh, uh, washing the oil off the cylinder walls, which leads to all the problems. We've actually seen customers take you know, a bottle of fuel additive, you know, some type of you know, polyetheramine based chemistry, right? And the driven uh, injector defenders are a great uh, version of that. But there's others out there that have that polyetheramine chemistry. It can clean that injector. We've seen fuel dilution levels drop dramatically just by a customer using one bottle of that tank of fuel, mm. cleaning it up. Because as you clean those injectors, it starts to spray again now, your fuel dilution goes down. When your fuel dilution goes down, your viscosity comes back up, wear metals go down, everything is happy again. So, so with an additive like that, and as you said, there's other brands out there, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, you, know, you fill your tank and you throw up a bottle of that additive. Mm -hmm. Is it recommended that once you put that bottle there, you run it through a fuel tank? Do you have to change the oil? Is it, no, is no, it, no. Is it something that... So if you're using a good, again, the chemistry is polyetheramine. So no, we talked about that in the last video, right. the additives video. Yeah, and that, that's the key thing. That's what can clean those deposits inside the combustion chamber in the uh, injector. So even for a port or even a DI engine, it can clean everything up really good. So when it does that, now you have that good spray pattern and all this. Don't have to worry about the fuel. You can I mean, still get the fuel getting in the oil, needing to change the oil. No, you can you put still it in. maintain your regular interval. Right. You know, yeah. So let's say you only put you know three or four thousand miles a year in the car. You only need to really do it once a year. Put it do once it in the year. fall okay. before you put the car back for the winter. That way you have it in there because a, a product like the driven storage uh, injection defender actually has storage protection additives in it, so it can actually stabilize the fuel during winter storage. And that actually brings up another good thing, Charles. What shouldn't they do during winter storage? And, and this, I, I give talks uh, to local clubs regularly, and everyone loves to just start up their cars in the winter oh, and let yes. them idle. We talked about that. And, yeah. and or some people think it's better. Oh, I'll put fresh oil in the in the spring, then I can drive all season. No, you want to change your oil before you put the car away. Obviously, you want to put some kind of fuel stabilizer in because the yep. ethanol enriched fuels don't have this shelf life of a non-ethanol right. fuel, they start going bad in, in weeks yes. ra rather than years. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and obviously not starting the car up and letting it idle. I, I tell people all the time, if you're gonna start the car, drive, yeah, it. Gotta, drive it. You gotta drive it and get it to operating temperature. Correct. Yes. Yes. Just starting it and backing it out of your, your garage a little bit so that the fumes go out and then pulling it back in. That's the worst thing. And idling is the worst thing you can do because you, ex you extend the cold start. Mm -hmm. And the same thing because one of the things we tell people, especially in colder climates, that you need to be gentle with the engine. Let it get up to temperature mm -hmm. gradually. You don't want to start it and just immediately go wide open because you're going to you're going to cause things to break. Yeah, like Mark talked about another video. Mark talked about another video. You're putting geometry against you at right. that yeah. point, right? Yeah, so uh, limiting throttle, waiting until the engine's to complete, uh, completely warmed up before you actually use full throttle or, or full power, that's one of the best things you can do. But some people think, well, I need to let the car idle to warm up before I drive off. And no, unless it's 
sub zero. Right. And, and maybe you might want to give it 15, 20 seconds uh, when it's really cold yeah. to let all the fluids, let right, everything, right. Fl and the transmission to get all the fluids going to drive off. But in, for most people, starting it up and just immediately going off with it, that's the best thing you can do because that's yeah. the quickest you're going to get it out of cold start. Uh, what else is there? More frequent oil changes. Uh, we usually recommend taking the factory interval and cutting in half. But if, if you're somebody that's driving the car year round and you're driving it in cold weather, even so we say six, month, uh, six months or 5,000 miles. But if you're driving it every day in really cold weather, you're sitting in traffic a lot, I'd call that severe service. Mm -hmm. And you really might consider going to a three, a three month or 3,000 mile, a shorter, shorter interval, interval. Yeah. because oil's cheap and engines are expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and another variable in here is actually the oil that you use. Like we discussed in a previous video, uh, a lot of people, especially in the Cayenne world, swear by the Ceratec additive, mm -hmm. which increases the moly and the boron content, which those are two friction modifiers. And like we discussed, those additives can bond to the aluminum and provide extra wear protection. Uh, is, but that, is that a bottle additive, the Ceratec? The Ceratec is an additive yeah. that you okay. can put in the oil. But but really, you want an oil that already has it in there. Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. Because, yeah, unless, like, like Lake has discussed before, if you're adding an additive to an oil, you're creating a science experiment. Right. You yeah. really don't know. And we're not tribologists like you are. <laughs> and I wouldn't even dare do it, right? Yeah, yeah. So using an oil that has molly in it and an A40 approved oil by default doesn't have, have yeah. molly in it. Oh. So if you're using a Porsche approved oil in one of these engines, you're not getting the protection that the molly friction modifiers provide to you. So you need to look to a non-approved oil because they can't make an A40 oil and have the molly that it right. needs to protect it, then it wouldn't meet the, stand meet the, the, meet the requirement for the standard. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so that's, what else do we need to, any other bits of advice for people? Well, in the, in the viscosity is part of that too, right? That's it, what I was gonna ask you, yeah. a little bit, we'll call it more viscosity. Yep. And don't, when I say that, don't just instantly jump to viscosity grade, like yeah. so, just for example, the DI40 is a 0W40, but it actually is thicker than like the Mobile One 040. Okay. They're both 040s, but this one has a higher high temperature, high shear. Mm -hmm. At HTHS, high temp, high shear viscosity, that's what your engine really sees when it's running. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. You want a higher high temp, high shear. But like Cody Locks and the Three Bears, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So don't right. jump and go put in like a 2060 or something like that, thinking, well, that's got a much higher high temp, high shear. You said that's a- You said thicker. Yeah, <laughs> go, and then go too far because then back to cold climates, right. not having enough oil flow. You want to have enough oil flow to lubricate the engine, but you don't want it to be too thick so that it doesn't flow enough. And it causes stress right. on the components. Or be yeah. too thin. Right. So that, that's where you know a lot of people have a good results with the 5W40 over the 0W40, but it's really about having that higher high temp, high shear. Or if you, if you have an engine that has early signs, it has, it has no symptoms mm -hmm. of, of any piston slap, it's not burning oil, the tailpipe's not sooty, but you bore scope and it's just starting and the oil analysis maybe has a little bit elevated, you can go one grade thicker. So you can go to like driven FR50, which is a 5W50. Yeah. And that gives you a little more cushion because uh, the piston uh, and ring system, it, offer, it uh, operates in what's considered mixed lubrication. Mm -hmm. So you have some hydrodynamic where, you where the parts are running on an oil film, but you also have boundary layer where you actually have contact, yeah. actual metal-to-metal oh, metal metal, contact. Yeah. So the piston cylinders are running in mixed. So the additives are important, as are the viscosity. And really the only downside to running an oil that has a higher high temperature viscosity is fuel economy. Mm -hmm. and, but, and that's why the OEMs push for thinner oils, because better ratings, it, better ratings yeah. it improves fuel economy. So, yeah. so that's, that's a good segue. So, so things you didn't know, um, whether or not your, your motor may have had bore scoring. So here, those were the tips to share with folks so that, you know, things you can do. But let's say you did, a, you, you did send your oil mm -hmm. sample in, let's say you did do um, a scope of it and you see early signs mm -hmm. of bore scoring. Now, if that's the case, as we talked earlier, like that's not the end of the world. Because it, no. it may happen, it may happen. Mm -hmm. And it you may be- You can live be, with it. You can live with it. Yep. So that's the good news, but living with it 
as you said earlier, the, the, the stuff still applies. Good, good fuel, good oil. How you um, you know run the Your engine? Your diet when it's has cold. to change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So, but you, but you have to modify it just. A little bit more now that you know that your motor has, has yeah, if you've got it and you know you have it you need to be running the top tier fuel yep. you need to be probably running a 5w50 like charles said that has the molly in there that way you're giving it a little extra viscosity a little bit of protection you're doing make you're doing everything you can with the fuel to make sure you're not getting a uh, fuel wash you're going to protect that bore as much as you possibly can by doing those things and that will extend the life of it even with the condition being there as long as possible. Yeah, and I think this is where you go into protect and monitor mm -hmm. mode, right? Yep. Yes. You protect and monitor and just keep an eye on it. And I believe you said it um, when we were talking earlier is, you know, at some of these stages to see to the pants driving, you wouldn't even know. Yep. yep. And the thing is, if you identify you have it, then you really need to do, go on a scavenger hunt and find what is contributing. Is it just dirty injectors? Maybe you have a bad injector. Do, right. I, do you have a vacuum loop like we discussed, smoke testing the engine, mm -hmm. yeah. to find where you have a crack in a plastic hose that's causing it to have a leak that causes the ECU to enrich the engine. You wanna find if there's anything contributing to it, that'll help extend. And we've seen people figure out what the problem is, put the thicker oil, and go years without the problems progressing yeah. so as long as it's caught early yeah, yeah you gotta find the root cause find the, the root problem. cause so yeah. investigate right. yeah. that's why it's important like by talking to oil all the time but once you can identify a high fuel dilution you need to find out what's going on don't just say well it's two and a half percent fuel dilution well that's just okay i drive i do short trip driving well no 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 no, yeah. no. Yeah. find out why i mean yeah. literally this morning i got an email from a customer that had had high fuel dilution was tried a different additive, but then started getting some misfires and realized he had a bad injector. Oh. So by doing the oil analysis, he was able to find the fuel dilution problem, was find, able to find the root cause. Well, in his case, he probably has prevented having bore scoring ever occurring because he found the bad injector before it ever showed up and caused any problems mm -hmm. in, his, his, in his engine. Very good. So there you have it. Just a number of things that you can do to hopefully prevent bore scoring. If you do find out that you have bore scoring, you can live with it and performance wise, as you, as you both said, yeah. you may not even notice a difference. But if it gets to a level where it is severe, that's where you wanna watch the next episode.